couple days ago, it was almost 90 degrees here, summertime. But it's cooled off since then. But it gives the trees a, a big wake up call when it gets, gets like that. So they're starting to come alive. This shorter discourse on the simile of Hartwood, Sutta number 3O. That's what we're going to do today. And I, I like this sutta because it explains a lot. Of course, every sutta explains a lot, so that's nothing new. But I particularly like this sutta. It's one that I used to give a lot when I was in uh, Asia. Thus have I heard on one occasion a blessed one was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anathan Pindika's Park. Then a Brahmin went to the blessed one and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and said to the blessed one, Master Gotama, there are these recluses and Brahmins, each the head of an order, the head of a group, a teacher of a group, excuse me. a well-known and famous founder of the sect regarded by many as a saint. And then it goes through the names of these different teachers, which I'm not gonna do because they're hard to pronounce. Have they all had direct knowledge as they claim or have none of them had direct knowledge? Or have some of them had direct knowledge and others not? This is the kind of question that was asked to the Buddha a lot. Now listen to his answer. Enough, Brahman, let this be. Have they all had direct knowledge as they claim or not? Or have some of them had direct knowledge and others not? And the real answer is, that's only speculation, which leads to gossip, which has no real uh, worth to it. So I shall teach you the Dhamma Brahman instead of try to get into all of this nonsense speech. Attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, sir, the Brahman replied. The Blessed One said this. Suppose Brahman, a man needing heartwood seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, came to a great tree standing possessed of heartwood. Passing over its heartwood, the sapwood, the inner bark and the outer bark, he would cut off its twigs and leaves and leave them, uh, take them away thinking they were heartwood. Then a man with good sight, seeing him might say, this good man did not know the heartwood, the sapwood, the inner bark, the outer bark, or the twigs and leaves.
Thus, while needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, he came to a great tree standing possessed of heartwood and passing over its heartwood, sapwood, inner bark and outer bark. He cut off the twigs and leaves and took them away, thinking they were heartwood. Whatever it is, good man, whatever it is this good man had to make with heartwood, his purpose is not served. Now you can also take a look at the different types of spiritual practice. Almost all of them think that it's uh, Uh, they're working with heartwood. And there are many practices, not only what you would call meditation practices, but their, their form of practice for different uh, end results that aren't uh, necessarily um, going to lead them to a happy realm. Now in another sutta, there's uh, this guy that started this practice of acting like a dog. He would, he would sleep in the dirt he would uh, curl up like a dog. He would eat his food that was in the dirt. And he thought that was the way to become reborn as uh, enlightened. And he, he really was serious about this practice and he would, he would try to wag his tail, but he didn't have a tail. So he, he just kind of wagged his backside when he was happy. And uh, he would bite people if he got angry at them. And the Buddha came along and said, well, that's a, that's a kind of practice. That's, that's for sure, but it's not going to lead to your end result that you want. It's going to lead to your being reborn as a dog. Now, anytime you're reborn in uh, an animal realm, it's really, really hard to get out of that realm. It's really difficult. So it's, it's kind of amazing that some people, they um, have visions right before they die. And if they have a vision of an animal right as they are dying, they will be reborn in an animal realm. And once you're in the animal realm, you, you kind of like it in some ways, in some ways you don't. And it's really hard to get out. So, there are some kinds of personality, some people that they kind of act like animals. And uh, this brings me to a story of there was a woman in Burma that was a butcher. And she spent her whole life killing animals or killing pigs mostly because that's what they, they do in Burma. They eat a lot of pig. 
and uh, about a week before she died, she started crawling around on her hands and knees and acting like a pig. And this distressed the family very much. And they went to a monk and, and the monk said, well, uh, why don't you show her some of the things that she, she when she was a, a when she was the butcher when she was younger, uh, some of the tools that she used around to repair things and do things. So the family went back and they, they thought, ah, the thing, the tools that they, this uh, woman used most was knives. That's what that was her trade was using a knife. And the woman acting like a pig saw the knives and had a ha had a heart attack and died right then. And she she had those visions of being that animal. So now she's probably in the animal realm somewhere. You don't know how long they last in one one form or another. But an awful lot of the animals are um, satisfied being an animal. but they live in a state of fear and they live in a state of anxiety. Uh, if you, you look at a bird that's sitting on a branch, he's not just taking a nap right there and, and not paying attention. He's always looking around to see if there's somebody, something that's going to get him. So there's this fear and anxiety and they get pretty used to that kind of feeling and they kind of like that kind of feeling. So they stay in the animal realm for so much longer period of time. Anyway, suppose a man needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, came to a great tree standing possessed of heartwood. Passing over the heartwood, its sapwood, the inner bark, the, he, he would cut off the outer bark and take it away, thinking it was heartwood. Then a man with good sight seeing him might say, this good man did not know the heart would. Thus needing heart would, he cut off the outer bark and took it away thinking it was heart would. Whatever it was this good man had to make with his heart would, his purpose will not be served. And, and I'm, I'm going to shorten the sutta quite a bit because it just goes through until the, the person finally does get the heartwood and his purpose will be served. So too, Brahman, here some clansmen go forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness, considering I am a victim of birth, aging and death, of sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. I'm a victim of suffering, a prey to suffering. Surely an ending of this whole mass of suffering can be known. When he has gone forth thus, he acquires gain, honor, and renown. He is pleased with gain, honor, and renown, and his intention is fulfilled. 
on account of it. He lauds himself and disparages others. I have gained honor and renown, but these other monks are unknown with no account. So he arouses no desire to act. He makes no effort for the realization of those states that are higher and more sublime than gain honor and renown. He hangs back and slackens. I say that this person is like a man needing heartwood who came to a great tree standing possessed of heartwood and passing over the heartwood, the sapwood, its inner bark and outer bark, cut off its twigs and leaves and took them away thinking they were heartwood. And so whatever it is he had to make with heartwood, his purpose will not be served. Now this is a a, a classic example of the way the Buddha taught and the, the progress that you see as, when he keeps on making more examples. <coughs> I have met quite a few monks that they crave gain honor and renown. And uh, they aren't interested in doing any more studying. They, they're kind of lazy and they don't, they don't do anything else thinking that this is good enough for this lifetime. So there are some of those kind of monks that are around one of the mistakes an awful lot of people think is when you see someone in robes that they are uh, special and they have all these high qualities of peace and, and tranquility and, and things like that. And it's not necessarily true. It depends on their training and what kind of training they have been doing. Um, sometimes in the news you can see angry Tibetan monks. Well, they're the young monks that want to get more involved in political things of their country rather than develop their own minds so that they can become a force that inspires other people to do that, to do less harmful things. And that's just an example of the gain honor and renown that, that some monks crave and they want to do that, but they're mostly young monks who are very ambitious and they, they want to become popular so that they can have a lot of different things given to them. Anyway, here Brahman, some clansman goes forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness, considering I'm a victim of birth, aging and death, of sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair. I'm a victim of suffering, a prey to suffering, surely an end of, of ending of this whole mass of suffering can be known. When he's gone forth thus, he acquires gain, honor, and renown. He's not pleased with that gain, honor, and renown, and his intention is not fulfilled. He does not, on account of it, laud himself and disparage others. He arouses desire to act and makes an effort for the realization of those states that are higher 
and more sublime than gain honor and renown. He does not hang back and slacken. He achieves the attainment of virtue. He is pleased with that attainment of virtue and his intention is fulfilled. That means keeping the precepts, in case you're wondering what that was. Attaining virtue, you have to work at it. And you start seeing that it is a kind of protection that uh, is like a bubble around you. And people that are not so wholesome have a tendency to not be want, wanting to be around you. And as soon as uh, you start slowing down and realizing that keeping your virtue, you have better collectedness of mind naturally. And it makes my mind much more uh, delightful. And when you get around other people that are virtuous, it's really easy to communicate with them. So the, the more you can keep your precepts, the better life becomes and the more prosperous you become. Now, prosperous is not a word that just means money. Prosperous is a word that means uh, having good friends and that you can hang out with and laugh with. That you can trust. And you can help each other and practice your generosity with each other. So I'm going to go back just a, a little bit and so he arouses no desire to act any further. He just keeps his precepts and thinks that's good enough and makes no effort for the realization of those states that are higher and more sublime then the attainment of virtue. He hangs back and slackens. I say that this person is like a man needing heartwood, passing over the heartwood, its sapwood, its inner bark, cut off its outer bark and took it away, thinking it was heartwood. So whatever it is, he had to, whatever he had to make with heartwood, his purpose will not be served. Here, Brahman, some clansman, goes forth out of faith from home life into homelessness, considering I'm a victim of birth, aging, and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. I'm a victim of suffering, a prey to suffering. Surely an ending to this whole mass of suffering can be known. You know, this is the reason that people uh, start searching for uh, the uh, the way 
to get out of the the suffering states that we keep on involving involving ourselves in for instance the depression or sadness or dissatisfaction of something or another anger fear you start looking for there's got to be a better way than this this doesn't work the way i'm doing it now so let's let's uh, spend some quality time and start looking for different ways to overcome these problems so When he has gone forth thus, he acquires gain, honor, and renown. He's not pleased with gain, honor, and renown, and his intention is not fulfilled. He achieves the attainment of virtue. He's pleased with the attainment of virtue, but his intention is not fulfilled. He does not, on account of it, laud himself and disparage others. He arouses desire to act and he makes an effort for the realization of those other states that are higher and more sublime than the attainment of virtue. He does not hang back and slacken. He achieves the attainment of collectedness. He's pleased with the attainment of collectedness and his intention is fulfilled on account of which he lauds himself. He does, on account of which he lauds himself and disparages others. I am constant, I am collected. My mind is unified, but there are other monks who are uncollected with their minds astray. So he, he arouses no desire to act and he makes no effort for the realization of those other states that are higher and more sublime than the attainment of collectedness. And that's when a lot of people start to look towards doing some meditation. And to some degree, there is relief and they think, ah, yeah, this is much better. But they also become more aware. An interesting thing with hindrances is as you become a more aware of a hindrance, it seems to get bigger and more intense. But it's because you are becoming aware of that hindrance. And you're seeing it through uh, finer uh, kind of microscope. So it might look like you're not progressing at all with your meditation because you see these hindrances and they can come up at any time and you, you get an emotional upset and you become angry or fearful or mad, whatever it happens to be. And it seems like, oh man, I really suffer. I'm causing myself so much suffering. But just that awareness of that hindrance, you have improved. Although it doesn't feel like you've improved at all. And there's, you, you don't feel like there's any personality development. 
Well, I get just as mad as I did before, but you're seeing it more clearly. Ergo, if you are, or when you become aware of it, then you stop getting so involved in it and it starts to lessen a little by little, but it takes years and years and years of practice to be aware of mind and how it actually does work. So you develop a little bit of concentration. Now, I don't like the word concentration because there are many forms of concentration that don't lead to the same end result as what I'm showing you now. But there is some relief with that kind of concentration and sometimes you can even have a, a blissful feeling come up and your mind can get real quiet and that's all forms of concentration. The reason I keep telling people over and over again that concentration is not the same as what I teach or the Buddha teaches because they're not following the Eightfold Path. They're not following right effort. The force of the concentration pushes down the hindrances so you feel like you have a pure mind for a while, which you do. But you know there's still, still something more to do if you're really aware. So if you get into an emotional state and you, you come and you, you sit in meditation and you go through the hindrances a lot and eventually it start, your concentration starts to get a little better and a little better and finally that concentration, the force of it suppresses the hindrances. Now, of course, the hindrances are important because that's where you take everything personally. I am that. And you identify with that and that causes all kinds of troubles and misunderstandings about how mind works. So having a mind that can become concentrated means that, let's say you're reading a book and you're really involved in reading that book. Uh, somebody walks into the room and makes a noise and it will boink you. Oh, you scared me. Have you had that happen before? Now, what's the problem with that? Your mind is out of balance with your mindfulness. they need to be equally strong and then you won't have that kind of uh, disturbance with your, your uh, sitting practice or when you're really concentrating hard on something, you don't notice anybody around you, right? That's suppressed. 
until some kind of action of some sort comes along. It can be a person, it can be somebody throwing something at you, it, it can be uh, uh, any kind of sensation. All of a sudden it pulls you out and it's a shock. It's a shock to your system. And that means that your mindfulness was being suppressed at that time. You were only aware of just reading that book or, or looking at something with deep concentration. It's not to say that concentration is bad. It's not. It simply just does not lead to the end result that um, is the path to the cessation of suffering. It doesn't lead there. Now you can have quite good collectedness of mind. Your mindfulness can be very sharp and you can be aware of your surroundings so that if somebody walks up, you know that they're there. You don't necessarily have to acknowledge them. But if they start talking to you, you're not going to get a shock like you do with the one-pointed concentration. I had one student that was very stubborn. And he would come into the meditation hall and we had a clock that made noise ticked real loud and before he would start he knew it was going to disturb him so he would take the clock off the wall and took the battery out so it didn't make any more noise and then he would go sit and i'd come in checking on people to make sure everything was going well and I would see the clock and I would put the battery back in the clock and put it back on the wall. And he had lousy meditation because he got so much into his dislike of a sound. And sound is really neutral. It's either a pleasant sound, a painful sound, a neutral sound. What difference does it make that it's there? And I, I question him quite often. When he got out of his, re, his uh, sitting, I would go up to him and I would say, well, how was that sitting? Well, it was fine for a little while, then somebody plugged the clock back in and it disturbed my meditation. And after that, my meditation was very bad. Well, guess what? Who didn't like the sound? Who took it personally? who caused their mind to get very upset and disturbed so that they couldn't sit in good meditation anymore. And who do you have to blame for it? Well, it's easy to blame the clock or the person that turned the clock on, but is that the truth? The truth is 
that a sound is just a sound and it's impersonal. There's nobody home. There's nobody there. There's no reason to become upset just because a sound arose. I mean, even in the forest, if you sit down and you become quiet, there's sounds all around you. Wind blows a little bit and it, it moves the branches and it shakes the leaves and there's sound. You're going to get angry at that because it, it disturbs me. And sound seems to be one of the biggest things that people get involved with not liking. You know, I, I went to uh, quite a few retreats in America and I would see people sitting with earphones and they put plugs in their ears first and then they use the earphones. Why? Well, that way I can have good meditation, except for the pressure that's on your ears and distracts you even that way. It's really funny. And if you walk in a forest, uh, like a uh, I used to go to Yosemite quite often in California. And it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. That's my personal opinion, but it really is something spectacular. And in one part of the Yosemite Park, they have these redwood trees that are huge. Uh, some some of these red one of the redwood trees they they measured it by people taking their hands and holding it and going around the tree and it took 15 different people to get around that's how big around the tree was anyway if you're quiet you sit down calm your mind, you can hear these trees talking. They, they talk very slowly, so you have to pay attention and you can hear what they're saying. Even in my forest here, trees talk. When it gets ready to rain, the trees start to actually sing. And this is a kind of concentration you can develop. It's not harmful, but when you keep it in balance with your mindfulness, there's more clarity in the way you think and less hindrances come up and distract you. One of the steps of developing good meditation starts with keeping your precepts without breaking them. And then you start developing more and easier, a tranquil mind that's peaceful and calm. When you get that, your mind starts to become more collected, more at ease, more truly aware of the inner workings of how mind actually does function. And it's really kind of fun when you 
uh, get used to doing it. Now, my book, Life is Meditation, Meditation is Life, is a pretty good book, even if I do say so myself. But just the title gives you the idea that meditation is not just about sitting only. Meditation is about practicing all the time in your daily life. Do you have hindrances arise in your daily life? Well, yeah. Well, that's no different than sitting where hindrances come up. The trick is being aware of it and not taking it personally and using your six R's even during your daily activities. And the more you get used to doing that with sitting, the more you get, you will get to practice your meditation while you're doing your daily activities. You start becoming more and more aware of how you cause your own pain your anxiety, your dislike of this, your like of that, you're, you're getting involved, taking all this stuff as if your mind was in control of everything. So, yes, I understand there might be times where you go a day or two days or even more without using the six R's. But the more you use the six R's with your sitting meditation, the more you'll remember to use the six R's with your daily activities. And the more you use the six R's with your daily activities, the easier it is to go back into your sitting meditation with a mind that's still and undisturbed. Here, Brahman, some clansmen gone forth out of faith from home life into homelessness. Considering I am the victim of <coughs> birth, aging, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, I'm a victim of suffering, a prey to suffering. Surely an ending to this whole mass of suffering can be known. When one has gone forth thus, he acquires gain, honor, and renown. He's not pleased with gain, honor, and renown. And his intention is not fulfilled. He achieves the attainment of virtue. He's pleased with the attainment of virtue, but his intention is not fulfilled. He achieves the attainment of collectedness. He's pleased with the attainment of collectedness, but his intention is not fulfilled. He does not on account of it laud himself and disparage others. He arouses the desire to act and make an effort for the realization of those other states that are higher and more sublime than the attainment of collectedness. He does not hang back and slacken. He achieves knowledge and vision, knowing by seeing or understanding.
He's pleased with the vision, our knowledge and vision, and his intention is not fulfilled. On account of it, he lauds himself and disparages others thus. I live knowing and seeing, but these other monks live unknowing and unseeing. So he arouses no desire to act. He makes an effort for the realization of those other states higher and more sublime than knowledge and vision. He hangs back and slackens. I say this person is like a person needing heartwood, passing over heartwood, cut off the sap, the inner sapwood and took it away as if it was heartwood. So whatever it was that he wished to make with heartwood, his purpose will not be served. Okay, here, Brahman, some clansman goes forth out of faith from a home life into homelessness, considering I'm a victim of birth, aging, and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. I'm a, a victim of suffering, a prey to suffering. Surely an ending to this whole mass of suffering can be known. When he's gone forth thus, he acquires gain, honor, and renown. And he's not pleased with gain, honor, and renown. And his intention is not fulfilled. He achieves the attainment of virtue. He's pleased with the attainment of virtue, but his intention is not fulfilled. He achieves the attainment of collectedness and he's pleased with the attainment of collectedness, but his intention is not fulfilled. He achieves knowledge and vision and he's pleased with knowledge and vision, but his intention is not fulfilled. He does not on account of Okay. Nor does he laud himself and disparage others. He arouses desire to act and makes an effort for the realization of those other states that are higher and more sublime than vision, uh, knowledge and vision. But what are the states that are higher and more sublime than knowledge and vision? Here, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana. Now, for those that are new to uh, the teachings. Jhana is a word that is misinterpreted to be understood as a concentration or a hypnotic state. And that's not, not the way it is with this form of meditation. Uh, <clears throat> this is where Venerable Pune G. I kind of, uh, well, we kind of agreed to disagree because he was very much into his psychology and, and uh, Freud and other philosophers. And I didn't necessarily see that the same as the Buddhist teaching. But he tried to justify it as 
part of the Buddha's teaching. So we agreed that uh, it's okay. You have your opinion, I have mine. Now let's go on. The definition of jhana is a level of understanding. Not deep concentration. And the way you attain that is by using the six R's. You recognize that your mind is distracted. Release the distraction by not keeping your attention on it. You relax the tightness caused by the distraction. How is it caused by the distraction? The distraction is a hindrance. <clears throat> the hindrance arises because sometime in the past you broke one of the precepts and you took it personally. You said, I am that. That's why when the distraction comes up and you use the six R's, you must use the relaxed step. If you don't use the relaxed step, your mind is going to get into a different state and it will take you off of the path that the Buddha taught. That's how the importance of this is so necessary to understand. So you talk about uh, the six R's, recognize, release, relax. You're relaxing and letting go of that false sense of I am that. You are developing a mind that doesn't have any distractions in it and is clear and pure because you have let go of that tension and tightness in your head, in your body, in your mind. Then there is the development of the wholesome. And that is learning to smile more. Learning to have a light mind that has some joy in it. And then bringing that kind of mind that is very clear, very uplifted, you bring that kind of mind to your object of meditation, either your spiritual friend or one of the, one of the directions. And stay with that for as long as you can. So when we're talking about getting into the first jhana, this is the first major step that the Buddha taught. And this is really a biggie. because your mind is so wholesome and pure when you get into the first jhana. If you never do anything else in your life with the spiritual path, that brief moment of being in the jhana is so powerful that you will be reborn
either in the Deva Loka or the human realm. That's pretty good. Just having that very brief glimpse is so wholesome that it pretty much starts pointing you in the direction of um, the spiritual path that the Buddha taught to the understanding that this stuff actually does work. Okay. Okay, now again, with the stilling of thinking and examining thought, this sutta is called the Noble Silence Sutta. This is where noble silence begins. Okay, uh, a monk enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence, stillness of mind without thinking and examining thought, with joy and, and happiness born of collectedness. This too is a state higher and more sublime than that knowledge and vision. So this is where you stop verbalizing in your mind. The thing with the jhanas is that you can be in one of these states while you are doing your daily activities. It takes a lot of practice to be able to do that, but it is worth the effort. Your mind is wholesome. There are no distractions. Your mind has joy in it. And the joy will last for a period of time. And it turns into a tranquil, peaceful, happy mind that is very collected and has equanimity in it. So you can, you can do that with any of the jhanas and that will help your daily activity while you are in the jhana. Your mind is going to become much more uh, organized. Your thinking is going to be organized. Your mind is going to be clear. You can notice when you're in a jhana with your daily life, you can notice the disenchantment of things starts to become more and more prevalent. You're going to, you're going to start seeing it more and more easily all the time. So you can walk around in a state of feeling good and equanimity, balance. And that takes a lot of the suffering and pain out of your daily life takes away a lot of the worries and anxieties that seem to build up these days so easily. And again, with the fading away of joy, a monk abides in equanimity, mindful and fully aware, still feeling happiness with the body. 
he enters upon and abides in the third jhana on account of which noble ones announce he has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. You can be in that jhana, you just have to practice it enough. You can be in that jhana while you're walking down the street or while you're doing something at work. And your mind is going to be organized and it's going to be very easy to do things easier than you ever dreamed possible. Again, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a monk enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. Now, this is a real interesting thing. When you come on retreat, you're here for 10 days and you follow the instructions, your progress in the meditation is going to be very fast. And when I say very fast, I mean, as sometimes it's shocking how fast it can be. Your progress can just zoom when your mind is ready for it. And when you are walking around with full equanimity, balance of mind, your mind becomes so much more clear and alert. And that is a really fun state to be in because there isn't so much suffering. There's still a little bit left. And there are uh, habitual tendencies that we have or emotional things that come up that trigger our mind. The emotional things are um, not as troublesome when you have equanimity. They have a tendency not to come up, but if they do, then you have a tendency to let them go much more quickly than ever before. Okay. Oh, I've been talking for a while. And uh, the rest of the sutta gets into the arupa jhanas, the mental realms where your mind is much more alert to subtle little changes. until you attain Nibbana. But because I've been talking so long, I, I start to feel guilty about doing that. And I want to know what you think. I want to know what your uh, Questions could be, is this clear enough for you to understand it and see where it's going? Anyway. Do you have any questions? There's no such a thing as a bad question. And if you want to start getting longer suttas, 
you have to come to Dhammasukha. <laughs> Sometimes I get really carried away and give a two hour Dhamma talk or two and a half hour Dhamma talk. But I hope it's interesting. Dante, thank you for your talk. Yes. I'm just wondering if you can clarify for me. I think I understood most of the Sutta, but where it says he achieves knowledge and vision, that came before the jhanas, and I, under, I realize I don't understand that very well. Can you just explain the knowledge and vision part, please? Basically, there's, there's different ways to attain knowledge and vision. One, by studying the suttas themselves. Okay. But there, there can be some light meditation that's done before uh, light meditation. I, I mean by uh, reciting the nine qualities of the Buddha over and over again. Uh, that gives you a, a knowledge and vision of a direct uh, experience. Is that like an insight? Can be. You get insights all along the way. Sometimes they're really tiny and you don't really consider them as an insight, but you, you have a deeper understanding of something that you hadn't realized before. That's knowledge and vision. But it can be, it can be about anything. And then all of a sudden, it kind of turns into it. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's how that works. Thank you. So I could call this a form of vipassana because of that. Hmm. Because you get insights all the time. But I don't want to confuse anybody and think that it's just straight vipassana meditation because this is not. This goes much deeper than that. Just like the guy that's trying to get to the heartwood. You have to do it by stages. And the straight vipassana can be one of those kinds of stages. So it's not that it's wrong. It's not anything to argue with somebody else about. But it, taking the more mature approach to your spiritual practice says that you agree to disagree. It's okay that they have their view of the way things work. It might work, it might not for anybody else, or it might, might work or might not for you. And it can be helpful. So don't make your minds hard and rigid. Make your minds very pliable and accepting. Now, accepting doesn't mean that you have to follow that rigidly. It just means that you accept, yeah, there can be some good qualities in doing this that I've never experienced before, but it might be there. So keep your mind open. Don't be so rigid, which happens an awful lot. Don't be so rigid of it has to be this way. That's like saying everybody's life has to be exactly the same. And we know that's not true. Okay. Did that help clear it up? Thank you very much, yes.
Okay. Good. Anybody else with a question? Hi, Bhante. Thank you for the sutta today. You're very welcome. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned about the hindrances and how they can appear uh, more intense, or more apparent, because I've been experiencing that uh, with respect to restlessness, especially. That seems to be the hindrance yeah. that visits me most. Um, yeah, but, but I had a question. More closely is what, what's okay. happening. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and because, I'm glad you mentioned it because I was becoming frustrated and thinking I'm doing something wrong. Um, but my question is, um, so if, if a student, if we were a student in your retreat and um, let's say you were practicing observing um, mind, quiet mind, right. and we're towards the end of the retreat, we're able to go right there during each sit. Now, after the retreat, if I sit in that fast, so I generally start each sit, I'll, I actually will take the three refuges and five precepts, relax for a minute, and then start my meditation. So if I'm starting, I don't radiate to the six directions. I'm just going right to observing the mind or trying, you know, uh, trying to observe quiet mind, but I don't achieve any jhana because of the hindrances. So is it best to move back to... Well, loving... How do you know whether you attain jhana or not? Well, my, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so my understanding is when the hindrances are upon us, we're not in jhana. Am I mistaken there? Right. You're not in jhana at that time. Right. So that's happening a lot right now with me, especially, like I mentioned with restlessness. So would it, is it... Would yeah, it more... trying too hard still. Yeah, yeah, definitely a lot of that, right? I wish you'd develop your sense of humor so you'd stop <laughs> doing that. Right. Well, you're not there every day to remind me. <laughs> I forget. Uh, <laughs> but, um, okay, but I guess what I'm asking is, is it better to return to loving kindness, radiate to each direction, and then the six directions again? You're in charge of your meditation. Okay. So it's up to you. Okay. If there's parts of the the lower jhanas that you were in before that you want more time to experiment with instead of uh, always trying to get to the same end goal, which is kind of boring in itself, uh, spice it up a little bit. Take take time to just sit, make a determination. I'm not going to go more than uh, deeper than the second jhana for this this period of time. But it it gets kind of tiresome just trying to uh, experience what you think is coming. <laughs> right. And that will help relieve a lot of the stress that you're caught up in. Because you're pushing. You engineer you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's, that, that's a problem, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I understand. Okay, well, thank, thank you, Bhante. Okay. Um, I just kind of, something I just need to hear it from you, I think. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. I'm happy to help you anytime. You know that. Yes, thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Comments? Yes, Bonte, if I may. Yes. Thank you. Just to clarify my own understanding, uh, and thank you, Patrick, for the opening about hindrances. I also have um, uh, a bit of a, clear, a need for clarification, I suppose, about the hindrances, whereby you said that uh, the hindrances are rooted in, um, you know, a broken precept right. from the past, and that in that past event, there was also a false sense 
of I am that. So Oh yeah. Every right? time you break a precept, it causes a guilty mind, and that's what I am mind is. Right, but I just to clarify though, the the uh broken precept that happened in the past, would you say also had that element of I am that? Was, of course. Was, Every okay. broken precept has that in it. That's so, why it is a hindrance. So, so okay, so then using the six R's, a, as you emphasize the relaxed step, right? that is uh, a moment for us to choose to undo the I am that. Right. And, and then turn toward the wholesome, the impersonals, non-personal wholesome. Right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Just needed to tweak that in my mind, that understanding, so I can welcome the hindrances okay. more. I want to learn to welcome well, the hindrances. <laughs> don't, don't push them away. Just uh, when they're there, you can say hi to them. There you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that sounds like a plan. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Karen, did you want to say something? Yes, hi, hi, Bonte. Hi, everyone. <laughs> nice to see you. How are you this, this fine day? <laughs> I'm doing okay. We're snowing in the UK. <laughs> it's so weird. Snowing? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the last week. And it was 90 degrees here two days ago. Oh, so jealous. <laughs> Snow. Yeah. At least I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I don't know. Today, I, as I was listening, um, <laughs> the sutta made so much more sense than before. <laughs> before, I was just kind of like, oh, what, what, is, what is going on? <laughs> but yeah, today it clicked. So um, thank you for giving the talk, Mati. Good for you. Yeah, thanks. Um, oh, yes. So the question I had was, you mentioned that being able to be in jhana outside of the sitting, so like walking around or working, right. is that something that happens naturally as you do more formal sitting or do you have to practice it has, that? It has to be intentional. You have to, I mean, your mind is, is not to the state that it's always going to be wholesome. And so it has to be intentional for you to make up your mind that you want to direct your attention with this jhana. Okay. And I found that very helpful when I was going to the hospital and visiting so many different people. Because sometimes if, if I would uh was uh radiating equanimity they still had a lot of upset in their body now this is people that are really sick and and they're they were getting close to death uh so i would go back to uh, the second jhana and go and and stay with that joy for a little while and then i would i would f actually feel them become relaxed and at ease <coughs> <coughs> and their mind would uh, lose a lot of tension in it at that time So I found that useful. Never know what's going to happen, but it seemed like it was pretty good. Okay, so it's something you do on purpose. <laughs> right, it, it has to be intentional. Sometimes you can put a time limit on it, it's up to you. But the, th the thing that so many people are caught up in is only sitting. 
And there's so much more to it if you really do start practicing it and and working with going in and out of this jhana or that jhana. A lot more uh, fun in life when you do that. Okay? Yeah. So, and it's still possible for hindrances to come on. It's possible anytime mindfulness gets weak. For whatever reason. Okay. And then six R and continue. Right. Okay. Thank you, Banti. Okay. Thank you. I'm happy to see you again. Thank you. <laughs> Same. <laughs> okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So I wish you all a happy week, and I look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Thank you. See you next Sunday, Bandi. Thank you, Bandi. Thank, Thank you, you, David. Thanks, David. Thank you, Bandi. Thank you, David.